So, um, so, um, so what I'm going to talk about the general issue of when randomness, the ability to make random decisions by an algorithm, actually speeds up computation. So um, I think like when people first studied randomness, the following would be like considered a moderate view. So you could like ask some quantitative questions about when does randomness help speed up computation? And here, speed up, I mean by more than a polynomial factor. So there may be lots of times when randomness gives you a sublinear algorithm uh, when you have, and you can't possibly come up with a sublinear deterministic algorithm because you don't have time to read the whole input. But I'm, I'm talking about like standard algorithms where you're given the whole, you're able to read the whole input and where we, we don't like distinguish between n and n squared. At the moment, we will do that. We did that an hour ago, and we will do that in the future, but not for this talk. Okay, so um, so um, you could think that you know you could look at does for every hard problem, does randomness help on lots of inputs? That's kind of an extreme point of view. Every hard problem it helps on a huge number of inputs. That's very impossible, right? Does everyone agree? Does anyone want to say on every hard problem that you imagine, you know, that's hard for deterministic algorithms, randomness is going to help? Um, okay. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, but you know too much. <laughs> okay. So we haven't proved that, but it seems very impossible, right? So, um, but it could, well, even that it would help on a few instances of, you know, worst case instances of every hard problem, that seems somewhat implausible. And, you know, um, and maybe I'm saying, like, actually help on no instances. You know, there, the, there might be hard problems where randomness never helps. I'm going to switch that to probably. There might be in some instances of hard problems where randomness never helps. Okay. Um, on the other hand, you know, there are a few specialized hard problems where, you know, maybe randomness helps on, a, on many instances. It would seem like, okay, at least for the worst case instances, randomness might help for some problems. Okay. And, um, you know, and so if you think that, then maybe it's unlikely that randomness never helps um, super polynomially for any hard problem for any hard problem. Okay. This seems like a moderate point of view. Okay. So as, as Ryan was saying, we don't know how to rule out extreme points of view about randomness versus time. The one point of view we know how to m rule out is the moderate point of view. <laughs> <laughs> we know this one actually isn't true. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Okay, and I'm, I hope to like give you a sketch of why we can rule that out as a possibility um, before before the end of before the end of the hour. Okay, but um, it's a moderate point of view, but it holds a double negation. So I'm really not sure what the claim is. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I will. I'll be vague about that, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll give you a formal statement at the end. Okay. So, um, OK, so what kind of problems might randomness help with? So here are a couple of problems that, you know, were, that I think got a lot of uh, first attracted attention of algorithm designers to the, the potential for randomness. Um, so one is primality testing. So that was like the big killer app for randomized algorithms for many years. Um, Rabin and Solovey Strassen in the 70s both came up with randomized algorithms to test whether a number is prime in polynomial time. And it wasn't until the, the, this millennium that Agarwal, Kyle, and Saxena came up with an equivalent deterministic algorithm. There was a lot of work in the middle um, that I'm slurring over. Okay. But we now know that it's also possible to, to compute primality deterministically. On the other hand, there's this other problem that came up around the same time, maybe it's a little bit less famous, but has a, a lot of applications, 
called polynomial identity testing, where you're given some kind of algebraic identity expressed as an algebraic circuit, and you want to know whether that identity is actually valid. So this is actually used to um, do things like test equivalence of branching programs, as Valentin was telling me about the other day. Um, so, um, or reminding me of. So this was came first. Uh, there was like Schwartz, Zippel, DeMillo, and Lipton uh, came up with this idea again in the 70s, and de-randomizing this algorithm is still a, a subject of a, a lot of very interesting ongoing research, but it's only been de-randomized partially and for very special cases. Okay. Um, and here's a kind of universal problem um, for de-randomization. Okay. Um, if it's complete for the promise version of the probabilistic class, so it's complete for promise BPP, okay. and I'm going to try to not define that, but uh, hopefully people know what I mean. Okay. Um, so BPP means that you have a, a bounded error probabilistic machine. Promise BPP is say, okay, well, we'll relax the, the, the notion. You don't have to be bounded error um, everywhere. You just whenever you're not, we're not responsible for what happens. You can be problem centered. Right? Problem centered, yes. So talk about the problem, not the class. Yeah. <laughs> so the, oh, good point. <laughs> so, but in, in some sense, if we could, Given a circuit, and it's very easy just through random sampling, given a circuit to estimate the probability that the circuit accepts a random input to within a, a certain error bound like point, point 0.1, but um, it's not clear how to do this deterministically. Okay, so um, so why am I? Why are we talking about derandomization um, in this workshop? Well, say if you look at this problem. Um, it's of a familiar type. It's a, it's a kind of meta-algorithmic problem. An algorithm that takes um, another algorithm, namely the circuit, as its input and has to compute something about what this input algorithm actually does, what language or problem th this input problem solves. Okay. So um, another of the another meta problem that's kind of similar is satisfiability. Given the circuit, does it ever um, output one? Okay. So um, so a, a large theme of um, relatively recent research has been that these meta algorithm problems, meta algorithmic problems, provide a connection between upper bounds and lower bounds between proving that, um, especially in non-uniform models like circuits, problems are difficult and coming up with algorithms for, for other problems. Um, and here I'm going to steal sort of an intuition for why there's a connection between these problems for, from Ryan, um, who explained it to me as, as follows. Okay. So like in, in proving a lower bound, you're trying to show that whatever circuit you're given as input, there's an, in some sense fails to solve a problem. Okay, that circuit fails. In algorithm design, you're trying to show that for every input, the algorithm succeeds. Fail succeeds, circuit input. The connection is in a meta algorithm, the input to the algorithm is also the circuit. So if we can do a little flip and say the algorithm succeeds when the input fails to solve a problem, then, um, then we can connect in a formal sense the algorithm design problem to the, to the lower bound problem. Okay. And, um, and so the, I think De the context of derandomization was the first one where that connection was made precise, um, and um, and is also the Ryan's later work does the same thing for the satisfiability problem and related problems, but it also builds on the connections that were made uh, through derandomization. Okay. So I want to 
today and um, going on through the week, um, review the connections between in, in, in de the context of derandomization between the lower bounds and the algorithm design problems um, that come up by viewing derandomization as a, as a meta, meta algorithmic problem. Okay. And uh, uh, the two on this list okay, that, that sort of qualify as meta algorithmic problems are the circuit value approximation problem, sort of obviously a meta problem, but also this polynomial identity testing problem is a meta problem of a meta algorithmic problem of a different kind because the input is an identity and the identity ex is expressed as an algebraic formula or circuit. So, um, any questions so far about the, the high level? Okay. okay. And so, what I want to do today in the rest of this hour is talk about how we use lower bounds to design algorithms. And this was the historically the first the first direction, first kind of connection between the lower bound problem and the algorithm design problem um, that, was, that was discovered um, way back in the 80s, um, some version by Yao and then later by Nissan and Wigderson, um, um, sort of revised and revitalized the connection. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, later in the week, tomorrow, we're going to talk about this other direction, and then we're going to uh, Thursday talk about um, how you use that to prove one of the lemmas that Ryan's going to need in, in his work, the easy witness lemma, and uh, then Friday uh, go back to the polynomial identity testing problem and show similar connections for that problem. Okay. So, um, and I'm going to do, th you know, I'm going to try to get through a lot of material today. And the way I'm going to do that is by waving my hands vigorously. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you sort of what types of things have been done, but not give you the details of how they've been done. Um, and yeah, so what's been done, why it was done, not so much how, and n no proofs. Okay. So, um, so we need to, as, as sort of to c connect these dots, we need to make, we're saying the circuits for the uh, so here we're going to look at exactly this circuit approximation problem and show if we've got a sufficiently strong lower bound for circuit complexity, that gives us an algorithm for the circuit approximation problem. And hence, that circuit, since that circuit approximation problem can code pretty much any randomized decision problem, it gives us a, an algorithm for pretty much any randomized decision problem. Okay. So, um, and the way we need to do that, to connect the dots, to say, OK, the input to the algorithm design problem is a circuit. Okay? Um, and we need to say, have that circuit fail to compute to solve one problem if and only if our algorithm succeeds. So we need to design an algorithm so that when it's given a circuit as input, the alg our algorithm is going to work precisely when the circuit fails to solve a problem. And here's the type of problem that, um, that we want our circuit, our input circuits to have to fail. And that's the randomness distinguishing problem. <coughs> so the, a randomness distinguishing problem is we have some kind of map is defined relative to some kind of generator, G, that takes in an input that I'm going to call, um, say, N sub G, and outputs 
a much longer string t, a much longer t-bit string. In the, uh, the randomness distinguishing problem is the, the problem of um, given z, is it g of x for a random x or is it a random, is it itself randomly chosen? So to make it precise, you just say, is it in the range of this generator? But we're looking at a particular distribution of inputs to make it hard on that distribution by saying uh, we're either picking, 50% of the time, we're picking it at random from the, you know, as a random g of x, and 50% we're just picking it at random. And the circuit it has to distinguish, say, which one of these two possibilities is happening. And G is fixed and part of the probability So G is, yeah, so the, the, I should say like the, the G randomness distinguishing problem is for a fixed G, say which, which of these two possibilities. Um, so uh, the, um, so the algorithm, say we've got the algorithm for the circuit, circuit approximation problem, sort of the, the universal form of the algorithm based on this hard, the hardness of this problem, is to simply um, run through all x in 0, 1 to the n sub g and compute c of g of x and output the fraction that equal to 1. Is this, is this clear? Where did c come from? <laughs> so remember that we're, this is the algorithm for the um, approximate, what did I call it? What's the standard name? You know this. Circuit approximation problem? Circuit, yes. Circuit approximation problem. Um, so the input to the problem, so the problem this algorithm is trying to solve is given a circuit C, estimate the fraction of inputs, of random inputs, on which it's true, deterministically. Is that clear? So C is the input to the algorithm. So the algorithm on input C does the following. And you have to pick, you have to pick, so here you, you know, to figure out what the right value of n is, you have to say, uh, well, this circuit has t bit, let t be the number of input bits to your circuit, input circuit, and then figure out n sub g as a function, invert the function that maps n sub g to t. And that's how many random bits, pseudo random bits that you need for the algorithm. Okay. So this algorithm runs in time 2 to the n sub g time the ti times the time to compute g plus the time to compute c. But the, the time to compute C, is, is, you know, to evaluate C on an input is going to be negligible compared to the, to the other factors in, in every, every interesting application. I'm still confused. Okay. You're trying to solve the cap problem. Right. So the cap problem the is... The randomness distinguishing problem. Is, so the cap problem, say, if we fail to solve the... What we're trying to say is the algorithm fails, solves the, solves the, um, the algorithm, remember, okay, so let me look at this, this analogy. The algorithm succeeds on an input circuit to solve the cat problem if and only if the input circuit fails to solve the distinguishing problem. 
So ALG has access to. So let's do. Let me just. I'm just going to write that. Write that down yeah, that in big letters. Okay. So ALG of C succeeds. to solve <laughs> cap of C if and only if C fails to solve um, the G randomness distinguishing problem. So maybe like I'll put yeah. Alt seems to have access to a library of instances of G. Right. That That's right. So I think this is okay, so I mean we we could go like go through and and quantify this, but uh, but I think it is fairly clear. Okay. So there's there's the formal connection, there's the exact connection that we wanted, that the lower bound success you know, the lower, the algorithm design succeeds on every input if and only if that input fails to solve a related problem. Yes? Uh, the success or failure of C is the probabilistic statement. So I'm going to see... Uh, yeah, it's a probabilistic statement. So, so I, so say, so basically I should say if C fails to solve this um, with Say less than like ninety five percent success probability. I mean you can find fails to be that. Yeah. Yeah, so I need to you know, so like fails a, so if the the more that C fails, the better the estimate we have here. I put an arbitrary number point one as our criterion for success here, and so you get some other arbitrary number here that will be our criterion for failure here. Okay. Maybe I think it's more. Gonna, it's going to be more like fifty-five percent, just close to half. The way I defined it. Okay. Hopefully, this this is anyone never seen some ideas like this before? Is maybe restating them in a different way? Okay, but hopefully this is this is a general familiar idea that pseudo randomness makes uh, makes it a hard problem to distinguish the output of a pseudo random generator from a truly random output. Okay, so um, so then so that begs the question though, where do we get this generator G from? So our goal now is to come up with a gener you know, so we want to prove that from a generic worst case hardness assumption, we can mold that hardness problem, that hard problem, into this the form of a of a G randomness distinguishing problem for a suitable G. Okay. So that's where the work goes in in the what's called the hardness versus randomness or um, hardness to randomness, um, like, uh, I don't know what to call it. It's not really an area, but um, paradigm. paradigm. That, thank you. OK. So, um, so I want to say the, there's like a traditional approach and there, there are other approaches. I'm going to sort of like just present the traditional approach, and um, and because and then say why not only is the final result interesting, but every step of this traditional approach is an is in itself an interesting combinatorial problem that you'd be interested in even if you don't didn't care about randomness, or well, if you didn't care about this particular form of randomness. <laughs> So, um, okay. So what we're trying, so what are, what are, what is our general goal at this point? Um, 
I want to have like several parallel boards, so I think I'm going to erase everything at this point if it's okay. We're going to start with some Boolean function. F that I'm going to call F worst case. So, and what we'll know about F worst case is that this is going to be some function from 0, 1 to the n worst case to 0, 1. So just uh, a Boolean function on this number of bits. I'm going to keep everything concrete. Yes, we're going to be dealing with asymptotics at some point. Okay. But, um, and what we'll know is that the size, the, the minimum circuit size that computes this is at least some number S sub worst case. Okay. So keeping things totally generic. Okay. And so this, this I'm using to mean the minimum uh, circuit that actually solves this problem. The number of gates is the minimum circuit that solves the problem. Um, and what we want to do eventually is put in a couple of intermediate steps. What we want to do is, um, is eventually come up with can people, if I write this low, can people see the board? Okay. So come up with this generator, G, um, so that, so it's going to be on map N sub G bits to T bits. Um, and we want to say that if F is, is hard, then um, the the G randomness distinguishing problem is S sub G hard to solve with, with the 55% success rate that we use as our criterion. Okay. So this is no circuit of less than this size can solve this um, problem. And actually, we want this to be also be about T, because remember the inputs to the circuit is maybe going to be around the circuit size. Okay, because the circuit, or at least the number of inputs to the circuit, bounds the circuit size. So you can think about this hardness that we want left to be about the same uh, as the output for our generator. Okay. Well, we want to do this kind of constructively. So what that really means is that if we're given a circuit C, and this is you think of as the input on which our algorithm fails, then, and it's, it's less than S sub G size, then um, given that that circuit that distinguishes, successfully distinguishes the G um, randomness distinguishing prob problem, successfully solves it, then I'm putting some room for intermediate concepts in the middle, we should be able to solve, um, you know, use this to construct, so let's call this C sub G for a circuit that breaks the generator, we should be able to um, construct from that C sub worst case that solves the problem and have C sub worst case um, be uh, size less than the, the assumed worst case complexity of the function. Okay. So we want every step, every, every, uh, we want this connection to be constructive from any F sub worst case in fact, I'm going to put the 
uh, the the function that we start with, think of that as being as determining the generator. So also think of this map as for every function that determines a generator from that function. And and you know maybe this assumption is true and maybe it's not, but the implication should be true. So that means that if G isn't hard, if we're given a distinguisher, then we should be able to construct a, a circuit from that distinguisher that solves the original function in the worst case. So is this sort of high-level thing what we're, we're trying to... Um, so the right column is just the contrapositive of the left? Uh, is that, like, in some sense, there's... Yeah. It's just a contrapositive of the left. Okay? But I want to say that, that we're going to be talking, you know, what's also going to be important is not only that these things exist or don't exist, but that we can actually construct them. And that we're going to be given explicit recipes to construct them. Now, here we're dealing essentially in the non-uniform model. So when I say we're given explicit recipes, then... Um, what we're allowed to do is, you know, in going backwards, we're allowed to flip random bits because we can simulate random bits, uh, make random choices, simulate that as hardwired into our circuit. And we're also allowed uh, uh, some kinds of advice that tell us some informa a small amount of advice that we could hardwire into the circuit. So this backwards direction may not be completely deterministically computable from the circuit. We may need some information about our function uh, in particular to, to go in the backwards direction. Okay. So um, I think I over-promised uh, uh, a little while ago, so I don't think I'm going to make it to... Let me try to like see how, how much I can tell you, and then um, I may not like actually say why the... The, the moderate position is ridiculous, <laughs> uh, has been ruled out. Okay, so, um, so we can look at the same thing. So, Luca Trevisan actually had the, 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 uh, the following amazing insight. He said, well, we can look at this diagram just combinatorially. What are we actually doing here? Okay. What, what is the combinatorial problem? We need to go from a function to a generator, and then from um, uh, then be able to go from a, a circuit that breaks that generator to um, the worst case circuit that computes the function. He said, if you view this combinatorially, this is a randomness extractor. So I have to make a digression here. What is a randomness extractor? A randomness extractor is a function E so that um, it has two kinds of inputs. It has a, a sorry, I'm going to call it two kinds of inputs. Um, let's call this capital F, and this I'm going to call X. Okay. And we can think in our, our picture as capital F is going to correspond to this little worst case function, little f, and X is going to correspond to the seed that we're using for our generate to, to, to map our generator into a, a t-bit string. Um, so it's a, so this is called the, the seed, and this is called the input. And you think of the input as coming from a flawed random source, which means that it's coming from um, the uniform distribution. This is the simplest way to think of it as coming from a uniform distribution on a set script S um, of uh, where the size of script S is at least 2 to the 
little s. Okay, and this little s is going to have something to do with the size bound over there. Okay. And x, on the other hand, is picked truly at random as a truly random n bit string. Okay, so this is this f might be a much larger. Uh, string and in general it will be much larger than two to the uh, than than little s, um, but it has some randomness. And what we want to say is that whenever this is true, that this is very close to a uniform string on t bits. How does the construction of a generator give us an extractor? So the connection that, that Luca said is, let's take the f. f is a, a string, uh, and you can view it as the truth table for a Boolean function. Let's take the construction of the generator relative to that Boolean function that's coded by the string f, and see what happens on seed x. Okay, so let's. So, combinatorially, this extractor takes f um, to, you know, you think of plugging in f, the extractor takes f to a kind of function from uh, n bit strings. To t bit strings, and that's equivalent to the generator. And we want to say that if this, if this, um, if this extracted, if the, if the strings here are not random, if they have some property p, then f wasn't random. And if you look at what ha what what we get from this this construction is that if our um, if we ha use property p where the extractor fails to have um, that's a way in which the extracted bits are not random. We think of that as the circuit C sub G, and then with a small amount of additional advice. A small amount of additional information about f, we can construct a circuit, we can decode f. So with this property that fails, and a small amount of additional information about f, then we know exactly what f is. Okay? And in particular, that says, that gives a quantitative bound on how many functions this generator isn't random on. And so that says for any source with many more outputs than that, that number, the extractor is going to be random. Okay. So here, here's an example waving my hands vigorously. So, well, so what, what, what Lucas said is basically that any, any, um, any way of filling in this diagram also gives you this kind of really good randomness extractor. Okay, and so that that sort of like motivated us to say the, the way to fill in this diagram is to is to like make a randomness extractor that is sort of local, lo computably local. Okay. Um, it also actually led to progress on new constructions of randomness extractors based on hardness to randomness constructions that already existed. Okay, and if you look at what um, uh, what um, so how did how did um, how do we fill what what are the steps we use to go from this hard function to a, a generator? So the first couple of steps are um, are um, this function is just hard in the worst case. 
So the first kind of steps is to make to go from a function that's hard in the worst case to a function that's quantitatively hard to solve. Because this is like a, as people pointed out, we need like a, a failure probability here for this. This so it's not just enough that that we can't perfectly distinguish random outputs from uh, determine the range of G. We have to have some quantitative notion of failure. So the first um, few steps are to make are to make this function um, make a version of this function that ha that doesn't just have worst case hardness but has hardness um, more reliably. Okay. So the the first step is to go from f worst case to a function that I'll call uh, f somewhat hard. And it's also just a Boolean function, somewhat hard, to 0, 1. And so then we say that the size, say, of solving this problem uh, 0.9 of the time is, related, is, is still relatively large. So here, I mean, the, any circuit solves a somewhat hard problem if it's correct on 90% of the inputs. OK. OK. Um, okay. And so that, what that means here is, in the reverse direction, if we have a, a circuit that solves the problem 90% um, of the time, we need to come up with a circuit that solves F almost all the time. Okay. Um, then, from this, we create, and sort of naturally, you know, what we create is um, a function that's hard, not just some fraction of the time, but is almost indistinguishable from a random bit. Okay. So, F very hard, is a, is has size a half plus about the one in t that we're shooting for. So the advantage in computing, so here, here we're looking at a circuit that just gets the answer right on slightly more than the, the more inputs than it gets the answer wrong. If that's bigger than some related size S V H, and this is going to be on some number of bits, NVH. Okay. okay, and again, what this means in the reverse direction is we have to go from a circuit that's very hard to a circuit that's somewhat hard using a certain amount of randomness and a certain amount of advice, and not very much of either. Okay. So, um, if you get advice, do you need randomness? Well, the randomness could be advice. Uh, there's a reason I want to distinguish the two, but that reason is probably obsolete because I'm not going to have time to, to talk, about <laughs> uh, talk about why. It's interesting. <laughs> um, OK. So I want to say that um, I may not have time to fill in any of these steps, how, how they're actually constructed. They're all very interesting. Uh, but let me say that each of these, once you sort of live in the post-Luca world, we sort of like look for what were the combinatorial analogs of these things, and say every step is really interesting combinatorially. And so let me try to explain what each step means um, combinatorially, and say that and that actually once you see that, um, if you're familiar with some of the coding theory. Um, Constructions, then you could sort of guess how we're going to do it in the in the um, in the randomness to to hardness, hardness to randomness. Okay, so and, and um, okay, so what are we doing in this first step? We want to go from a problem that's hard in the worst case to a problem that's hard. Um, uh, 
a good fraction of the inputs. We can think of that as a kind of coding problem. We're trying to code this worst case hard problem by this somewhat hard problem in a way that's more robust, that even if we don't give all the answers for the somewhat hard problem, that still determines the answers for the worst case hard problem. So if you think about it in terms of this going backwards, we need a, to go from something, a circuit, that gets the right answer most of the time. So it's kind of like a noisy version of this function. The circuit gives you a noisy version of this function to exactly recovering the original function. So that's the sort of analogy would lead you to error correcting codes. So an error correcting code is a way, so we take a message, I'm going to call it capital F sub worst case, and we have a code that produces some longer string um, that I'm going to call capital F sub somewhat hard. And um, and then we send this uh, longer string uh, through some noisy channel. And we get some received bit, received message that I'm going to call C somewhat hard by being, being very leading. And what C somewhat hard is the, the relative Hamming distance between C somewhat hard and F somewhat hard we, we know it's going to be small, relatively small. So here I'm like normalizing by the length of the two strings. And then um, in the decoding process, once we receive this, we take C somewhat hard and we have to produce a, our guess as to what um, the original function was. And if everything is working, these two perfectly match up. Okay. So uh, error correcting code has the property that whenever the relative Hamming distance between the received word and the sent word is, then the decoding algorithm exactly recovers this. And if you think about this square, that's exactly what we want. Okay. Yes. And we need it to be, for our purposes, we also need it to be locally decodable. It's not enough. So what is, what's important is that we can define this in low complexity with an oracle for this. So if we look at this, so we're given a circuit here rather than an explicit message. So that allows us to evaluate any particular bit of this. And we need to be able to evaluate any, any particular bit of this. So this diagram is exactly a locally decodable error correcting code. And once you see that that's what we want, um, it's kind of natural to say, what, what is our, this is not historically how it happened, but um, what is our, you know, to go to our, our repertoire of locally decodable error correcting codes and say what, what are, what's available and there's only like two. <laughs> like there's Reed Miller codes and Reed, Sol Reed Solomon codes so I don't, and I can't remember which is where, which. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just going to say it's a, a Reed Miller Solomon code. <laughs> Okay, um, and so um, the Reed Miller Solomon code. If you look at it in term, it actually is uh, is really natural to to think about that in terms of Boolean functions, because what is the Reed Miller Solomon code? You take your message, you view it as the truth table for a Boolean function, you embed that Boolean function or interpolate that Boolean function inside a small degree function over 
um, a, a moderate size field. So what we we end up with is, you know, this this our um, our um, our new somewhat hard function is basically a, a function that's loaded, that's defined over a finite field, where um, it agrees with the original function when the inputs are Boolean and its low degree in each of these yi's. And, and it's easy to see that any Boolean function uh, embeds uh, in a number of ways into such um, algebraic functions over the field. And then uh, the decoding algorithm, the local decoding algorithm, um, has been looked at, you know, it's basically the, uh, the idea was looked at by Beaver and Feigenbaum, uh, by Lipton, and it's been used in a, a number of other contexts. I guess in this context, it was first introduced by Bob Ifor, now Nissan and Wigderson. Um, and what you do is you take, you think of this function as being defined over a large dimensional space, but you restrict the function to a line, and you make some, you, that contains the point that you want to evaluate the function on. So you have a, okay. And then you evaluate the function on the line you ignore, using, using whatever oracle you're given that approximates this function and hope that it agrees with the function on every point on this line. If so, your interpolation is valid, and your, the point that you really want to know is valid. And the, the main point is that actually the other points on this line individually are independent of the point that you start with. Because there's for any point here, at any point in space, there's exactly one line that goes between them. Sing. Waving hands vigorously. <laughs> Okay, and, and this is really also the known algorithm for, for decoding, uh, you know, that, that's been used in decoding. So, but this function is not necessarily Boolean anymore. It's not necessarily Boolean, so you have to do some work to make it Boolean again, which I'm going to also. It's not necessarily Boolean. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ignore that. <laughs> yes? So, on the, on the right column, uh, you use, this would be by advice that um, actually, so the whole point is that in this step, all you need to decode is randomness. There is no actually other, no actual other advice needed. So this one, you use some randomness, and it has a little bit of time, but it doesn't actually add any, there's no real advice needed. And the reason that that's true in terms of coding is, and it's not going to be true for the next step, is that in this regime, these codes are uniquely decodable. Okay. Um, and there are limits on how much you can, you can actually do this with, with a decoding algorithm that just returns one possibility. However, if you weaken the, um, if you weaken the criterion, and I know I'm going a little late, okay, then, um, you could define a list decodable code. And a list decodable code doesn't output one string. It outputs a whole list of strings. And the function, you know, it, these are all guesses for what this function, what the input was. And one of the guesses is correct with high probability. Okay. Um, the other thing, though, is we've already done this step. So the, the problem, okay, so um, actually, let me go back to this picture for a second. Okay. Um, what is the price we pay in this picture? We had a really nice decoding algorithm. The price we pay is that our encoding algorithm is not so nice. Okay. It's polynomial time computable, and you can put it in some smaller classes like um, NC1. Okay, but you can't get it down to uh, 
to there's no local encoding or even any kind of encoding in the polynomial time hierarchy in the in the AC zero I should say which would correspond to the, what that means is that if f sub w case is exponential time this function will still be exponential time if it's polynomial space this function will be polynomial space but if it's NP this will be polynomial space um, there's no there's no real complexity preserving reduction at this point in particular you can't do this with just oracle, local oracle access to the input function so this this part is actually global and we're going to be able to make all the other parts local and that's going to be a, a technical distinction that comes up in some results okay so that's like one price we pay for the simplicity of the decoding. Okay. But um, so one thing though that to our benefit in the second square um, is even though we are, we're going to have to move to list decoding because actually there's no other no you know it's just combinatorially impossible to have unique decoding from this small, very large amount of error, we don't actually have to have full decoding. What we can have, because we've already done this part, it's enough to get something that's somewhat close to our original function. So we only need this to be somewhat close. So the second square corresponds to approximate um, list decoding. Um, okay, so approximate means that, so approximate local list decoding still has to be local because we need to actually construct the circuit from the circuit. It's approximate in that the message that we reconstruct only has to approximately agree with the original message. Um, and it's list decoding in that we'll come up with a number of possibilities. And actually the advice here is going to be the log of the number of possible, uh, the log of the, the list size. That's going to be kind of inherent advice that can't be random. Okay. So, um, okay, so the second step corresponds to approximate local list decoding, which is kind of interesting, especially since you can do this, is a good, actually, a, you know, composing these two steps is a good way of making list decodable codes, and local list decoding, approximate list decoding, can be done even uh, locally, defining your, your encoding function as well as locally defining your decoding function. And sort of the, the, what these look like is just you take a bunch of bits and you XOR them together. Okay. Or you use the XOR construction on the function. And then finally, um, we can view this last step combinatorially as a kind of randomness extractor. Again, that's sort of not saving us a lot over the whole square. How, you know, what, what did going through these first few steps give us? We said that the whole square is a randomness extractor, but a randomness extractor from sources where um, i f of i is approximately uniform. So that means most bits look already look. You know, so the so I'll call these um, from randomness smoothed sources sources where most bits are already are already high entropy and there's some kind of global entropy. Um, and here uh, we also need some some non-randomness advice, but I. I think I'm totally out of time. Okay. So, but even though I'm out of time, now we've gone through all this work, let me just like summarize a few things that we, we actually get from looking at this. Um, 
So by sort of looking at things combinatorially, finding the, the optimal constructions for each part in different ranges of parameters, um, we can prove the, the following kinds of theorems. So, so this is like um, Bob I4 now, Nissan and Wigerson. So if there exists, so like if X is not contained in P slash poly, then promise BPP is contained in time, deterministic time, 2 to the n to the epsilon for every epsilon. Okay. So this is called a low-end de-randomization because we're making a, a relatively small assumption about the worst case complexity of, of polynomial time, uh, of exponential time complete com problems, uh, and get, by getting a relatively mild um, consequence here. And I guess I should also say infinitely often. <coughs> a high-end version says if there exists f in x in E, which is time 2 to the order n rather than 2 to the n to the, to the k, so that um, size of f is greater than 2 to the delta n for some fixed delta greater than 0, then um, promise um, p equals p. So then you get full derandomization from a suitably, from a stronger assumption. Here I'm saying, here I'm implicitly saying that this holds for every n, which is, here this was implicitly saying this holds infinitely often, which is why you get infinitely often here and, and everywhere here. Then one other result that I wanted to mention today, that just because I mentioned, I sort of implicitly mentioned it, why the moderate position um, is, is not right. Um, another paper of mine in Avi shows that if X is different from BPP, then um, promise BPP is in heuristic, um, heuristic deterministic time to the n to the epsilon. Uh, and what this means is that while there might be a few instances on which the, the algorithm fails, um, uh, you can't re there are so few that there is, it's actually an intractable problem to find any. Um, so if B, this was, you know, if X B were equal to BPP, this would say um, that every hard problem is randomness helps. So that would be a very extreme position. And then this says that um, if not, then uh, the problems on which randomness helps are, helps exponentially by the most amount possible are, are negligible, only very rare for every problem. So you can't have, sometimes some problems, randomness helps to the maximum amount, but it's not true for all problems. If there's any problem in which randomness helps reliably uh, by a huge amount, then, um, all, then it helps a huge amount for all problems. Um, and all of these follow the, the same paradigm. Um, okay. I think I'll stop there. Any questions or are there any uh, implications that you'd like to know that we don't know? Or I'd like to know that BPP is different from from like non-deterministic exponential time. Implications. So, okay, so like quantitatively, um, so the, they're, okay. You would like to know that index equal B, B implies false. Yeah. <laughs> um,
Right. Uh, so, um, the the sort of natural worst case to worst case, you know, the natural uh, most of the okay, I think most of the picture has been kind of filled in. Um, I guess if you go to to um, non-deterministic compu computing, we know fa fairly similar things, but I'd like um, I'd like to um, yeah. So like, what well, I can't say the answer without getting really technical. Next uh, tomorrow's lecture, we're going to talk about implications in the other direction, where you start with. Um, a generic algorithm for CAP and derive a circuit lower bound from that. Um, and what what I'd really like is if they became equivalences and they don't quite most of the time. Um, but the reason they don't they're not equivalences is kind of technical. It has to do with like this infinitely often here and the, the everywhere there. Um, um, Valentin, can you think of like some? What if you have super linear circuit lower bounds? Can you get an error? Oh yeah, that would be good. Yeah, in fact, yeah, that's. So, um, these work for a broad. You know, I phrase it in terms of arbitrary classes, circuits. You know, arbitrary circuits. We could also look at the same thing for subclasses of circuits. Um, and if we do thing, you know, if we do things like subclasses of circuits, like NC1, most things work uh, because they're closed under natural functions um, and closed under like polynomial time blow up. But if you try to do things quantitatively, said, what kind of result do we get if we have a, a super linear circuit lower bound? Do we get any kind of derandomization? That would be a great result. Right now, I don't. I don't see how we get even um, even any non-trivial randomization if we say prove an n squared lower bound. So, look at this in a more fine grain. 